Hey, uh, I just returned from the from the Virgin Islands from a delightful event that I ha that I organized um, with 21 physicists. It was a, I, I like small events, uh, and these were and I got to handpick the people. And uh, we, the, the topic of the meeting I made called confronting gravity, um, and the reason was I wanted to have a meeting where people would look forward to the key issues facing fundamental physics and cosmology. And if you think about it, they all revolve in one way or around another around gravity. I remember when we did it, someone said, well, you know, don't we understand gravity? Things fall from someone from the outside. But, uh, but really, many of the, of the key ideas that right now are at the forefront of particle physics, cosmology, uh, relate to our lack of understanding of how to accommodate gravity and quantum mechanics. Um, so I invited a group of cosmologists, experimentalists, theorists, and uh, um, uh, particle physicists and cosmologists, Stephen Hawking. We had three Nobel laureates, David Gross, Frank Wilczek, Gerard de Tuft. Uh, Well-known cosmologists like Jim Peebles and Princeton. Experimentalists, uh, Barry Barish, the head of LIGO, the, the, uh, the uh, gravitational wave observatory. We had observational cosmologists, people looking at the cosmic wave background. And we had uh, Mir Maria Sparopoulou from, from CERN, who's working on the Large Hadron Collider, which may a, d a decade ago, people wouldn't have thought it was a probe of gravity, but now, due to, due to recent work in, in the possibility of extra dimensions, it might be. And I wanted to have a series of sessions where we would, each of us, because there was only one, 21 people, we could each speak, um, try, and, try and speak somewhat provocatively about what, where, what each person is thinking about, what the key issues are, and then have a lot of open time for discussion. And so the meeting was devoted with a lot of open time for discussion, a lot of individual time for discussion as well as some fun things like, like uh, going down in a submarine, um, which, uh, which we did. Uh, we commandeered a submarine, and that was a delightful event uh, where we defied gravity by having buoyancy, I guess. But, um, uh, and there were a number of issues. We talked about, of course, uh, um, the, the classical gravity. E even the classical gravity has got, got key questions. Uh, the search for gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are likely to be I came away from this meeting, I guess, uh, realizing that they may be easily the next frontier. For a long time, I sort of poo-pooed it in my mind because it was clear it was going to be a long time before we could ever detect them if they were there, and it wasn't clear to me what we'd learn except that they exist. But one of the key worries that I have as a cosmologist right now, as someone who's been involved in the last decade in a lot of the exciting times, um, I'm very proud to have proposed dark energy before it was discovered, although I must admit I never believed it when I proposed it. Uh, uh, but I'm worried that cosmology could become like particle physics was in the 1970s and 80s uh, and 90s. Namely, we have this model, uh, we have these ideas and these parameters, and every experiment is consistent with this picture. And nothing tells us anything more. Nothing points to the fundamental physics beneath it. There's no direction. And and it's been very frustrating for particle physics. And some people might, have said, might say it's led to sensory deprivation, and which has resulted in hallucination, otherwise known as string theory. But, uh, uh, and that could, be a, that could be true. But in cosmology, what we're, we're having now is this cockamamie universe. We've discovered a tremendous amount. We discovered, OK, the universe is flat, which most of us theorists thought we knew in advance because it's the only beautiful universe. But why is it flat? It's full not of dark, just dark matter, but this crazy stuff called dark energy that no one understands. And, and it was an amazing discovery in 1998 or so, experimental discovery, as I say, in 95. We already had good indirect evidence, in my opinion, that led us to think that there was dark energy. But nothing, ever, what's happened since then is every single experiment agrees with this picture of coming, the, it's consistent with these ideas from inflation. We also had a session on inflation with Alan Guth there at this meeting talking about is it falsifiable, uh, uh, what, what is it predicts in, in the context of multiverses, which is an event they're going to be talking about at tonight here in New York City. Uh, and everything is consistent with the simplest predictions of that, but not in a way that you can necessarily falsify it. Everything is consistent with this dark energy that looks like a cosmological constant, which tells us nothing. It's a little subtle, but I'll try and explain it, and maybe it won't be explainable and you'll cut it out. We, we got this weird anti-gravity in the universe that is making the universe, the expansion of the universe, accelerate. Now, if you plug in the equations of general relativity, 
The only thing that, that simply, the simplest thing that anti-gravitates is the energy of nothing. You put energy in nothing and it's gravitationally repulsive. It's just the equations of general relativity tell you that. The symmetries of the theory require that. Now, that implies, this has been a problem in physics since I've been a graduate student. It was such a severe problem, we never talked about it. It's called the cosmological constant problem. When you put, apply quantum mechanics and special relativity, empty space inevitably has energy. The problem is, it has way too much energy. It has 120 orders of magnitude more energy than is contained in everything we see. Now that is the worst prediction in all of physics. Now you might say, if that's such a bad prediction, then how do we know what empty space has energy? The answer is, we know it has energy. We know at least empty space isn't empty because it's full of these virtual particles that pop in and out of existence. And we know that because if you try and calculate the energy levels in a hydrogen atom, and you don't include the, those virtual particles, you get the wrong answer. If you calculate, as Schrodinger did, the, the energy in a hydrogen atom, you get the wrong answer. And it was one of the greatest dis developments in physics in the 20th century to realize that when you incorporate special relativity in quantum mechanics, you, you have virtual particles that can pop in and out of existence, and they change the nature of a hydrogen atom because a hydrogen atom isn't just a proton and an electron. That's the wrong picture because every now and then you've got a virtual par electron positron pair that it pops into existence. And the, the, the electron is going to want to hang around near the proton because it's oppositely charged. The positron is going to be pushed out to the outskirts of the atom. And while they're there, they change the charge distribution in the atom in a very small but calculable way. And it's what Feynman and Schwinger and the others did. They calculated that effect. And the f effect allows us to get agreement between theory and observation at the level of nine decimal places. It's the best prediction in all of science. There's no other place in science where, from fundamental principles, you can calculate a number and compare it to an experiment at nine decimal places like that. So we know we have to include those things. But then when we say, if they're there, how much should they contribute to the energy of the universe? we come up not with the best prediction in all of science, but the worst prediction. Suddenly it says that en empty space should have so much energy we shouldn't be here. And physicists like me, theoretical physicists, knew they had the answer. They didn't know what, how to get there. It's sort of like that Sidney Harris cartoon where you've got this big equation and then the answer and, and, and the middle step says, and then a miracle occurs. And the one scientist said to another, I think you have to be a little more specific at this step right here. But uh, we knew the answer. The answer had to be zero. Be, the energy of empty space had to be precisely zero. Why? Because you've got these virtual particles apparently contributing huge amounts of energy. And you can, you can imagine in, in physics symmetries that exactly produce exact cancellations. That happens all the time. Symmetries that produce two numbers that are exactly equal and opposite because somehow there's an underlying mathematical symmetry of the equations. So that you can understand. But what you couldn't understand was how to cancel a number to 120 decimal places and leave something finite left over. You can't take two numbers that are very large and expect them to almost exactly cancel, leaving something that's 120 orders of magnitude smaller left over. And that's what would be required to have a, an energy that was comparable, compatible with, with the upper limits on the energy of empty space. So we knew the answer was there was a symmetry and the number was exactly zero. Well, what have we discovered? Well, there appears to be this energy of empty space that isn't zero. Now, that it flies in the face of all conventional wisdom in theoretical particle physics. I mean, it is the most profound shift in thinking, perhaps the most profound puzzle in the latter half of the 20th century. And it may be the first half of the 21st century, maybe the whole go all the way to the 22nd century. Because, because I, unfortunately, I happen to think that to resolve this problem, we won't be able to rely on experiment. Because when we look out at the universe, what m some people said is maybe this is something that isn't quite an energy of empty space. It's just something that's pretending to be that, that's mimicking it, but it's not quite that. And if it isn't quite that, we can measure that it's changing over time, and we can see what it is, and then we will know the actual energy of empty space is really zero, but this is some cockamamie thing that's pretending to be an energy of empty space. And the reason people hope they'd see that is because then you could hope you'd have a handle on it. You wouldn't need quantum gravity, which is a theory we don't ha yet have, to understand it, one of the biggest failures of, of, of string theory's many failures, one of the biggest, I think, is that it never addressed this cosmological constant problem. You'd think if you had a theory of quantum gravity, 
it would explain precisely what the energy of empty space should be. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was always one of the biggest failings of the theory that it never really addressed that problem at all. And we don't have anything that addresses that problem. But if this thing really isn't vacuum energy, then it's something else, then you might be able to find out what it is and learn and do physics without having to understand quantum gravity. The problem is when we actually look out what is out there and every measurement we've made right now is completely consistent with a constant energy in the universe over cosmological time. And, the, and that's consistent with a cosmological constant with vacuum energy. So if you make the measurement that it's consistent with that, you learn nothing. Because it doesn't tell you that it is vacuum energy because there could be other things that mimic it. The only observation that would tell you, give you positive information is if you could measure it was changing over time. Then you'd know it wasn't. Now, if, and I firmly believe it, all the evidence suggests to me that we are going to go on and keep measuring this quantity better and better and better and we're going to find out it looks more and more like a vacuum energy and we're going to learn nothing. And the only way to resolve this problem will be to have a theory. And theories are a lot harder to come by than experiments. Good ideas are few and far between. And what we're really going to need is a good idea, and it may, uh, it may require an understanding of quantum gravity, or it may require that you throw up your hands, which is what we were learning a lot of people are willing to do. In, 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 in the Virgin Islands, we, were, when we, were, we had a session on the anthropic principle. And what is surprising is how many physicists have really said, you know, I'm, uh, it, 20 years ago, if you'd asked physicists, do you hope that one day we'll have a theory that tells us why the universe is the way it is? They would say yes. They would say that's why I got into physics. The, the, they, they, they'd paraphrase, they might paraphrase Einstein who said, while referring to God but not really meaning God, when he said, my, the question that really interests me is did God have any choice in the creation of the universe? And what he really meant by that was did, is there only one consistent set of laws that works? If you changed one, if you twiddled one aspect of physical reality, would it all fall apart? Or are there lots of possible viable physical realities? I think most physicists 20 years ago would have said, on the basis of 450 years of science, that, that, that they believe that, it, that there's only one allowed law of nature that works that uh, fund, um, ultimately we'll, we might discover fundamental symmetry, some mathematical principles that tell us the nature is the way it is, because it's always worked that way. Every time there were these puzzles, you know, in understanding the strong interaction, uh, which was the first time string theory uh, was developed, it, you know, and you invented all this stuff, then eventually realized there was a fundamental symmetry that said, no, there were quarks, and they interact a certain way, and string theory died. That, that is the way science has worked. But now, and it's precisely because of this energy of empty space, which is so inexplicable, that if it really is an energy of empty space, the value of that number is so ridiculous that it's driven people to think that maybe, maybe it's an accident of our environment, that physics is an environmental science, that, that certain fundamental constants, that's one of them in nature, may just be accidents, and there may be many different universes in which the laws of physics are different. And the reason those constants have the values they have might be, in our universe, might be because we're there to observe them. It's not intelligent design. It's the opposite of intelligent design.